Dimitri L. Moore, Aristotle on the Socratic Dialogue. Thank you very much, Don. I hope everyone hears me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, so I'm going to read my paper and um, uh, normally everyone should have uh, the handout with, which I sent uh, before. I think it's more convenient for you to have the handout than you know, for me sharing my screen and, and giving the talk at the same time. Uh, so uh, I will, you know, it's a short handout, four pages long, and I will discuss a few, uh, I mean, the text that are on the handout. So uh, uh, I start for 45 minutes. So is Aristotle's poetics anti-Platonic? Uh, this question is as simple to formulate as it is difficult to deal with given the many problems raised by Aristotle's poetics. It is therefore most appropriate to begin by questioning the question itself. Should the question of the poetics anti Platonism be raised in the first place? It is not absurd to defend the idea that it should not. Since Aristotle discusses in the poetics a number of positions that he does not share and that he attributes to some, uh, yet none of these is Plato who is never named in the treaties. This should come as no surprise for the scope of the poetics is much more limited and precise than the agenda Plato sets himself in books two, three, and 10 of the Republic. Consequently, to ask whether Aristotle's poetics is anti-Platonic is a poorly formulated question, if one means by that, that it is the Platonic critique of poetry, which, to a very large extent would have motivated the philosophical ambition of the poetics. Does this mean that the poetics should be read without its, its possible platonic background? This would be just as damaging as seeing its main propositions as mere answers or criticisms addressed to Plato. On, the, on this question, one of the best guides offered by the abundant secondary literature on the poetics remains the work of Stephen Halliwell, on the, on the bibliography on the handout, uh, who distinguishes four major issues on which Aristotle distances himself from Plato. One, the nature, the nature of, and role of culture. Two, the topic of imitation. Three, the meaning and role of muthos. And four, the question of the relationship between art and ethics. Yet in the same book, Stephen Halliwell also lists in, a, in an appendix Aristotle's borrowings from Plato. From these fairly descriptive initial remarks, I infer that the anti-Platonism of the poetics is an ill-formed yet unavoidable question, and that in the face of questions of this kind, it is best to examine each particular case in order to form a general idea. It is therefore to the examination of one particular case at the very beginning of the poetics that I would like to devote the present paper. This case is the mention which Aristotle makes in Poetics 1.1, so this is T2 on the handout, of the Logoi Socraticoi, which should be read in parallel with fragment three, Ross, of Aristotle's dialogue on the poets, and this is T1 on the handout. And other Aristotelian and non-Aristotelian passages. The analysis of these passages is at the crossroads of two of my current projects, the first being the writing of a book on Aristotle's Socrates, which I would like to uh, replace uh, Thomas Demont's outdated, I think, 1942 monograph on the handout, on the bibliography. And the second project is the writing of a paper on the dialect form in the Academy after Plato. So the two questions which will guide my reading of these passages are, one, what do we learn uh, from them on Aristotle's view of the generic nature and distinct features of the Socratic dialogue? And two, is Aristotle's treatment of this uh, literary genre partly motivated by an anti-Platonic polemic? So the text of T1 has been constantly altered by its successive editors and has been the subject of much conjecture, which you can read in Yanko's edition and apparatus reproduced on the handouts. So this is page three on the handout I reproduced um, uh, Yanko's edition. 
This fragment poses at least two problems which explain these alterations. The first has to do with the information provided by Aristotle that Alexamenus of Theos, about whom we know strictly nothing except what Aristotle reports in this fragment, would have been the first protus to write Socratic dialogues. The second concerned the precise nature and scope of the comparison Aristotle develops here between Sophron's minds and the works of Alexamenus. These two problems are made even more acute by the situation of this fragment within a broader passage from Athenaeus of Nocrates' Deipno Sophists, in which Athenaeus develops a fierce polemical argument against Plato. So whether this context facilitates or rather complicates the proper understanding of the, of the Aristotelian passages is a question that will need to be addressed. So I'm moving now to my first part, uh, the first part of my, of my paper. So uh, let us begin by concentrating on one crucial bit of T1, namely Aristotle's fragment therein, and in particular, the comparison which Aristotle proposes. Following a Yanko's edition, I have chosen to keep the text edited by Kybel in the reference edition of the Date Note Sophists with two alterations, one of which has been suggested by Kybel himself in his introduction. So first, <clears throat> editors have struggled with the syntax of the sentence, as can be seen from Yanko's critical apparatus many suggestions were made to make sense of it. In particular, some editors proposed to amend the clause which carries most of the conceptual load of the passage, namely the two accusatives, logus kai mimeses. This is line eight in the, in the passage. It has thus been proposed to read logus kai me mimeses or logus e me mimeses. Uh, between, uh, behind these proposed modifications was well summarized by Natorch in his article on Alexamenus in the Real Encyclopedia. Natorch proposes to accept Jan's two corrections and adds another of his own, which consists in reading in the last word of the fragment, not dialogon, but logos. The sentence thus presents a chiasmus by which Aristotle underlines that Sophron's minds which are imitations as their names indicate, are also logoi, and that Alexamenus's logoi, which, are, which as their name indicates are logoi, are also imitations. The text has been changed in one respect in accordance with Kybel's suggestion in his apparatus. In, in the following clause, ude emetrus ontas, which is the word um, added, tus kalominus sophronos mimus. By restoring the participle, it is possible to render the value of the clause in line, as we shall see, with Aristotle's general argument. Without this addition, I think it is difficult to see what to make of the first negation, ude, from a syntactic point of view. So these conservative choices were dictated by the fact that, as it stands, the text allows for an account of Aristotle's argument, which is consistent with the parallel passages in the first chapter of the Poetics. This, this is T2 to which I now turn. Okay. So this is the second part of uh, my paper. So first, a few words about the context of T2. Um, the first chapter of the Poetics introduces the concept of mimesis by proceeding inductively, that is, by mentioning various forms of mimetic arts and showing that these forms share a common feature, namely, that they produce an imitation, even though they differ in other respects. In the first chapter of the Poetics, Aristotle thus puts forward the idea that epic and tragedy, comedy and the art of dithyram, as well as most of the art of the olos and the lyre, have all in common to be imitations. These forms are distinguished, however, by a, the means by which they imitate, b, the objects to which they are attached, and see the modes in which they imitate. In the rest of chapter one, Aristotle examines the different means used in the imitation produced by the arts that he has just mentioned, and in particular by those that constitute the core of his interest, 
namely the arts we would call verbal or literary. These means are, as is well known, ruthmos, logos, and harmonia, and may be used separately or in combination. From 47a23 onwards, Aristotle first considers the imitation en harmonia kai ruthmo, which concerns the art of the olos or the panpipe. These musical arts indeed use rhythm and melody to represent characters, but not language. Then Aristotle comes to the imitation only en ruthmo, deployed by the art of dancers, which uses only rhythm without melody. These combinations also make it possible to account for the main genres of poetry, the most familiar at the time, epic, tragedy, comedy, dithyram, and to make them all appear as forms of mimesis, differentiated by the way they combine logos with rhythm uh, or melody. Thus, epic uses logos combined with rhythms, rhythmic language or meters, to produce verbal imitation, whereas dithyram it takes by combining logos with rhythm and melody. Note, moreover, that this analysis has the consequence of subtly emphasizing the possibility of a mimetic art, which makes use of logos alone without rhythm or melody. One would expect Aristotle to examine each category of verbal arts according to the following tripartite scheme, mimetic prose, logos alone, meters, logos with rhythm, and song, logos with rhythm and melody. This is not how Aristotle proceeds. Rather than exploring this tripartition, he explores two alternative categories, the melodic and the non-melodic verbal arts. Among the latter stand the examples which we shall consider. So I shall now read T2. But as for the imitation which uses only prose language or only meters, and which in the latter case either mixes them together or uses only one kind of meter, it has not been given a name so far. For we have no common term for both Sophron's and Xenarch's minds and Socratic speeches or logoi or dialogues. Not even if someone produced the imitation in question using trimeters, elegiac meters, or other such meters. So at 47A28, in the first line of our passage, Aristotle distinguishes between imitation by means of logos alone, prose language, imitation which uses one type of meter, and finally imitation which uses several types of meters. The first sentence of the passage quoted that I just read, sorry, includes an even more precise division, actually a double division, for Aristotle distinguishes therein between prose language and versified language, and within the latter category, logo that combines several types of meter and those that use only one type of meter. Aristotle then makes it clear that a common denomination is missing to refer to the imitation produced by the different means that he has just listed. So what has so far remained nameless? The anonymous art in question includes mimetic prose, which does not use meter, and epic poetry, which uses meter only. The examples which illustrate this anonymous art are the Socratic logoi, mimes, and epics. Hence, Aristotle does not need a name for these genres, since he mentions the names of some of them, but he notes the absence of a name that would express the common feature in terms of medium or expressive means shared by mimesis in prose and mimesis in non-melodic verse. The crucial idea is therefore that the art of poetry must take into account mimetic works that are not written in verse. As the rest of chapter one of the Poetics argues, Empedocles uses meters, but that does not make him a poet any more than Herodotus had he written his history in hexameters. So this is how I suggest one should make sense of the last clause of the passage. So this is line four to five in, in, in T2. So it corresponds to the Greek, ude e tis dia tiamet, trimetron e elegion ton alon tinon ton toyuton poyuto ten memesin. Most translators, as you can see on the handout, it's after T2, uh, that is uh, Ardi in French, Duporoc, Ilalo in French, or Halliwell in, in English, uh, to name but a few. Uh, consider that Aristotle examines here a new case 
the mimesis produced by the use of trimeters, or eject meters, or the like. And that 10 mimesin is referring to imitation in general. In my view, 10 mimesin could just as easily refer to the imitation produced by the kind of speech Aristotle has just been talking about, namely Socratic logoi and mimes. Hence my translation by the imitation in question, to make that clear. And I'm, I'm, I'm not the only one to say to that this. I noticed that in the, in the most recent uh, French translation by Pierre Destré, he does the same. Uh, if this is the case, uh, his argument would be the following. A, we do not have a name for the kind of prose imitation which is evidenced in Socratic logoi and mimes. And obviously, uh, the phrase logoi kai mimeses used in T1 is not an appropriate name. But B, if by hypothesis, the kind, uh, uh, this kind of imitation had been produced, not in prose, but in verse, whichever type of meter is used, we would not have an adequate name at our disposal either. For C, this would be a purely external criterion consisting in merely pointing out the type of meter used, and it would not reflect the real criterion, namely mimesis. Clearly then, Aristotle's purpose is not to mention Socratic dialogues and mimes out of interest in these literary genres, which will not be mentioned again in the poetics. The idea is rather to illustrate by a very telling example, the fundamental criticism which Aristotle makes in this chapter to the traditional classifications. If genres as different in tone, theme and language as Sophron's mimes and Socratic dialogues are both mimetic, then the taxonomies that are based on the sole use of meter or lack thereof are deficient. The very nature of Socratic dialogues and mimes shows that these taxonomies include works that are mimetic, but not in verse. And this idea is further confirmed by the symmetrical example of Empedocles, who is not a poet and a mimetic author, although he writes in verse. So let us now examine in more detail the crucial point for our purpose, namely the comparison introduced by Aristotle in, in, the, in the passage. According to him, there is something common to the minds of Sophron and his son Xenarch and the Socratic dialogues. Three different questions should be raised here, I think. First question, what do Socratic logoi and mimes have in common, according to Aristotle? Second question, what exactly does Aristotle mean by Socratic logoi? And a third question, what is Aristotle's intent in classifying Socratic logoi as works that belong to the genre of poetic imitation in prose? So I shall address the first two questions now, and I will come back to the third question later. So concerning the first question, we learn from Horden's 2004 study on Sophon's mimes that mimes represented male and female characters of low extraction, probably speaking the Dorian dialect, engaged in scenes of everyday life, some of which may have been borrowed from the comedies of Epicharmus. To that extent, the meager information at our disposal on Sophron's and Xenarch's minds neatly corresponds to Aristotle's own view that the subject matter of dramatic imitation concerns man in action. It is surprising, however, that in our passage, Aristotle brings together the comic imitation of ordinary people and the Socratic conversations whose subjects and style are, are far more complex. And this brings us to the second question, what exactly does Aristotle refer to when he mentions the Socratic logon? So the commentators interested in the Aristotelian testimony on Socrates have mostly focused on this question. So to give a, a few examples, uh, by Socratic logoi, does Aristotle mean the whole of Socratic literature, as Yoel, for instance, argues? Or more restrictively, Socratic lit literature, with the exception of Xenophon, as Meyer holds? Is he referring to only to Plato's dialogues, as Taylor contends, or merely to the Platonic dialogues, which we think were written first, the so-called Socratic dialogues. And this is, for instance, Jaeger's view. And Jaeger, I just say that in, in passing, compares the expression entoi Socraticois to the expression entoi Platonicois used by ancient authors to refer to Aristotle's early words. 
So each of these solutions, and there are others, I guess, uh, has its merits, and they all manifest the importance of the issue at stake. For if one considers, like Yoel, for instance, uh, that Aristotle is here referring to the whole of Socratic literature, one could argue that Aristotle sees in the genre of the Logos Socraticos a purely literary genre, whose aim is certainly the imitation of the Bios uh, um, uh, Socraticos, but not historical accuracy. Um, conversely, it could be argued with Taylor that the fact that Aristotle makes imitation an essential element of the Socratic Logoi is strong evidence that these texts, and particularly Plato's dialogues, should be read as reflecting the teaching and practice of the historical Socrates. Um, Demont, uh, 1942, uh, on, in his book on, on Aristotle Socrates, uh, opts for an intermediate solution. Uh, Aristotle is certainly aiming, among other things, at Plato's Socratic dialogues to the exclusion of the great Platonic masterpieces, such as the Republic, Timaeus, and late dialogues. Um, moreover, Demont adds, the crucial role which Aristotle gives to imitation and the comparison he makes with Sophon's realistic minds indicate that although historical fidelity was never a goal in itself for the authors of Socratic dialogues, we should not refrain from thinking that their imitations retain something of the historical Socrates. In my view, uh, the answer to the question raised above should be broad, but there is no compelling evidence that should prevent us from thinking that Aristotle uh, is not referring in T2 to Plato's dialogues or to some of them and to other Socratic words as well. Okay. Uh, so I now return to T1. Just as uh, he does in T2, Aristotle examines in T1 the common category under which Sophron's minds and the so Socratic Logoi fall, a category whose name is missing according to the poetic. This category corresponds to the double predicate which appears in the fragment, Lugus kai mimese. How should we understand these two words? Uh, in the poetics, Logos often, referred to, uh, often refers to prose language as distinct from the metrical use of language. In this sense, Logos here stands for any form of narration, including dialogues. It is therefore likely, as Yanko 2011 uh, suggests, that Aristotle is using a hendiadis here to express the idea of prose fiction. For if Logos simply meant prose speech here, the text would be redundant, the close ude e metrus being line seven in, in T1 being common, I think, to the two accusatives, tus mimus and tus protus, blah, blah. Moreover, this interpretation is consistent with the passage uh, in Diogenes Laertius 3, book 3, uh, section 37, in which Diogenes reports that Aristotle said that the form of Plato's dialogues is intermediate between prose and verse. So once the meaning of logus kai minases is uh, possibly clarified, the question raised uh, by Aristotle becomes clearer, I think. Should this form of imitative prose be attributed to A, Sophron's mimes alone, B, to Anaximenes Logoi alone, or C, to both? The rhetorical form of the question and the parallel passage in the Poetics indicate that the answer Aristotle has in mind is most certainly the third. Thus, Sophron's mimes, which are imitations by definition, are also logoi uh, in the general sense of narrative as well as in the specific sense of dialogue, just as Alexaminus's logoi are mimetic. Considering that the terms used to refer to Sophron's works, mimus, and to Alexaminus's works, dialogon, uh, um, Considering those terms, one notes that each refers, as it were, naturally to one of the two predicates, to the exclusion uh, of the other. The name of the genre called mime clearly expresses its mimetic value, but this name hides, so to say, the fact that it is also a logos, namely a specific use of language. Symmetrically, the name used to refer to the works of Alexaminus, Dialogoi, expresses their discursive character, it does not make clear that they are mimetic works as well. Yet both Sophron's and Alexander's works are imitative 
discourses, representations, which should be understood according to the standards of Aristotle's innovative view of poetics concern, conceived as the art of mimesis. Thus, uh, as uh, Clay 1994, for instance, argued, it is likely that the speaker in T1, perhaps Aristotle himself, if we believe you know, the testimony in Cicero about Aristotle's dialogues, uh, it is likely that the speaker in T1 is putting forward the idea that mimesis is a broader category than versified texts, while his interlocutor to whom he would be responding would consider meter to be the decisive criterion for any imitation. And there remains the mysterious allusion to the no less mysterious Alexaminus of Theos. Uh, this is by far the problem that has troubled the most the successive editors and commentators of the passage. Uh, I think the literal meaning of the text transmitted by the manuscript is not in doubt. Aristotle does say that Alexaminus was the first protus to write Socratic dialogues. Corrections were proposed to read um, proterus instead of protus, and thus make the text less perplexing. Uh, so um, for, for the sake of, of brevity, I leave aside the discussion of these problems, which I, I wrote an appendix on that, but it, it, I'm going to be too long. So I leave that probably we can discuss that, of course, afterwards, if, if one wishes. So assuming, therefore, if only by provision, that the transmitted text is correct, uh, we may return to the third question raised earlier. What could Aristotle have had in mind in this passage of his dialogue on the poets? Uh, one thing at least seems clear. The mention of Alexaminus is made in passing. It is not therefore the question of the protos oretes that interests Aristotle here. Unlike Athenaeus and his source, which is most likely Favorinus of Arles, who was very interested in the, in the Eurymata and who discovered first what and so on. Um, so what the passage is concerned with is to show, uh, as I argued earlier, that Sophron's minds are as much as the dialogues of Alexaminus imitations, in short, that they both belong to the genre of literary performances, though not written in verse. So the central idea of T1 would thus be exactly similar to that of T2, but the fact that T1 belongs to a dialogue would explain why this idea is expressed as a rhetorical question addressed to the dialogue's interlocutors, who still accept the idea common before Aristotle, that it is a meter that characterizes poetics. For Aristotle, and this is inter alia what makes his approach so original, the main criterion of poetry is imitation, not the form of the lexis. Uh, and I'm moving now to my uh, third uh, part, uh, Aristotle's slander, uh, with an interrogation mark. Um, uh, I said uh, that the mention of Alexaminus was made by Aristotle in passing. It is true that this mention fits well with the fact uh, that the dialogue on the poets uh, seemed to have paid more attention than the poetics to the lives and individual works of artists. And there's a very nice uh, paper by Andrew Ford who um, uh, makes that very clear at this Ford 2010. It is difficult, however, given the context in which this passage uh, occurs, namely as part of an anti-Platonic polemic, not to wonder whether Aristotle is here criticizing Plato by pointing out that he is not the inventor of the genre of Socratic dialogue. So can this idea be substantiated in any way? Interestingly, we find such reading of T1 in an introductory treatise to Plato's philosophy, dating from the second century AD, of which only a few fragments remain in the papyri of Oxyrhynchos, uh, and whose author remains unknown. So fragment one of this papyrus recalls Plato's debt to Sophron's minds, which amounts in the author's eyes to discrediting Aristotle's thesis that Alexaminus was the inventor of a literary form which Plato then borrowed from him. In other words, Plato would have taken the dramatic form of his dialogues from Sophron, not from Alexaminus. Uh, 
So let me read T3. Uh, In this case, Plato, imitating Sophron the mimographer with regard to the dramatic aspect of the dialogues, Catato dramatic and tone dialogon. For we must not be convinced by Aristotle, who says in his slander against Plato, who protest pros Platona Bascanias. In the first book of his poetics, so clearly this is in the first book of On the Poets, uh, that before Plato, dramatic dialogues were written by Alexamenos of Tears. Apart from the confusion uh, between the poetics and the dialogue on the poets, the obvious problem which arises when reading this fragment is that its author, in mentioning Aristotle, specifies that according to him, Alexamenus was the first to write dramatic dialogues, not Socratic dialogues. The problem is made more difficult by the fact that it seems unlikely to assume that the author of the papyrus had direct access to Alexamenus dialogues, of which, again, we know absolutely nothing. So his information is therefore likely to depend on the passage of Aristotle's dialogue, which he criticizes. Is it possible to account for what the author of the papyrus could have understood by dramatic dialogues and for the relationship between this objective and the presumably authentic lesson reported by Athenaeus? Uh, one can actually account for this distortion and argue that the lesson reported by Athenaeus is accurate. Uh, the author, uh, and this is also the opinion of, of Yanko, uh, 2011, uh, the author of, of the papyrus criticizes Aristotle, not for saying that Alexamenus wrote dialogues before Plato, but for saying that he wrote dramatic dialogues before Plato. Uh, for it is the insistence on this qualifier, dramaticus, dramaticus uh, that explains, I think, the gar at line five of the argument, and then the, the argument, so to speak, in the, in, in the fragment. We can therefore assume that the author of the papyrus considers that Alexamenus did write dialogues before Plato, but that they were not dramatic. For Plato took this dramatic element from Sophron. Alternatively, one could argue that for the author of the papyrus, dramatic is simply a paraphrase of Socratic in Aristotle's text, in the sense that uh, the label Socratic dialogue would refer to a literary genre in which Socrates is the main character, or even in, in an even weaker sense, a genre in which the inquiry is conducted by questions and answers. And such a genre could be called Socratic as well as dramatic. So possibly the papyrus uh, fragment does not necessarily prompt us to reject the text transmitted by Athenaeus but it does not solve the mystery surrounding our passage and the otherwise unknown Alexamenus. On the other hand, the whole point of this papyrus is to state unambiguously that, in, that Aristotle in the first book of his dialogue on the poets, uh, and in particular in our passage, pursued an antiplatonic polemic purpose. Is this idea plausible? At a very high level of generality, I think it is. Uh, for uh, although the polemical of this particular passage cannot be proved with compelling arguments, it is not impossible to argue that Aristotle in his dialogue responded to the pr provocative condemnation of poetry as mimesis in the Republic. This being said, it is nonetheless true that no such polemic against Plato can be found in chapter one of the Poetics. One might even add that reading Poetics 1 together with a passage in the rhetoric, and this is T4, in which Socratic dialogues are also mentioned, manifests Aristotle's deep understanding of this literary genre as revealed by his comparison with Sophron's mind. And indeed, Aristotle twice brings Sophron's mind and the Socratic dialogues together, making each an example of mimetic prose. So in what sense exactly can we say, according to Aristotle, that the Socratic dialogues are mimetic? Are they mimetic because they reflect the character of Socrates, its particular ethos, in the same way that Sophron's characters reflect human types 
Are they mimetic because they develop a heuristic method that was Socrates' own? That is because they represent at least two interlocutors, one of whom questions and the other answers? Or are they mimetic for other reasons? So let us now briefly consider T4 and move on to my fourth and final part. Um, so T4 uh, from the rhetoric, uh, develops the notion of ethical narration, ethique diegesis, about the judicial genre. The speaker who makes use of a narrative in a given trial must seek to suggest the moral dispositions of the particular protagonist involved in the trial. And one way of doing this is to reflect in speech the prohiresis of the protagonist in question. The prohiresis itself depends on a moral end that must therefore be made clear. And to illustrate the importance of making this end manifest, Aristotle provides two examples, one of which is a negative confirmation and the other a direct confirmation. Mathematical reasoning and by extension, the treatises that gather such reasonings do not care about an end to be reached, which implies that the reasoning of the mathematician does not include preferential choice. In contrast, Socratic logoi have ethe because they presumably include everything that mathematical treatises exclude. They represent preferential choices and are concerned with moral ends. So in what sense then do Socratic logoi have a moral character? Uh, in light of what Aristotle explains in the Poetics, namely that the objects of mimesis are human beings engaged in moral action, it can be argued that according to Aristotle, the Socratic dialogues are mimetic, not only because they represent speaking characters, but more importantly, because their conversations, their logo refer to ethical choices. And this is this was very, very uh, convincingly and very forcefully put forward by a, a recent paper uh, by Jacques Branchefic, um, in 2018, published in French, which was, of course, a, um, an old paper of Jacques, but which was published quite recently. So it's in the bibliography, Degesis et Nimesis dans l'œuvre de Platon. And Jacques uses that passage to, to put forward this idea, which I, I think is very convincing. Um, so Socratic dialogues can take the form of memorabilia, apologetic speeches, or dialogues. But the crucial point is that they all demonstrate ethical choices through the characters' speeches. For according to Aristotle, these choices mainly constitute the character of man. I think this is a powerful interpretation of the genre of the Logos Socraticus, which has the merit of accounting for all the literary forms of this genre. C4 in particular helps us understand why Plato favored this dramatic form. So just to build on, on, on the distinction Aristotle made between mathematical reasoning and, and, and Socratic dialogue, Plato, for instance, did not express his philosophy more geometrico as, you know, for instance, Spinoza did, because by hiding behind characters to whom he attributes speeches in conformity with their character, Plato opted for a literary form which is in full agreement with the ethical subject of most of his dialogues. Uh, so, and, and this interpretation is the reason why I'm not really convinced I, on, as you can see in text four, I also printed um, uh, one remark by, uh, by Rudolf Kassel, uh, who proposes to delete the end of T4. So he proposes to delete Perry, Toyutern, Gar, Legussi, uh, presumably because he thinks that it was a later edition by someone who did not understand that uh, uh, the text was, was about, um, uh, that he understand that, that the text was about the, Socrat the Socratics and not Socratic dialogues. But I think, I think the text should remain as it, as it stands. And I think the, the perfectly coherent reading of it as it stands. Um, so let me conclude uh, with uh, three uh, remarks. So following the hints of uh, the anonymous 
author of uh, T3, uh, I have been investigating whether or not it can be said, uh, given our current state of knowledge, that Aristotle pursued a polemical end by making the Socratic dialogues and thus Plato's dialogues examples of mimetic prose. I think that T4 suggests that this is not Aristotle's purpose. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Aristotle demonstrates a deep understanding of the mimetic character and ethical projects driving these dialogues. Read as I, as read as I have suggested, these passages are not signs of Aristotle's slander against Plato, I think. On the contrary, they evidence his extraordinary power of taxonomic analysis and synthesis in the service of his reading of ancient literature. Secondly, um, this power of analysis and organization of all forms of existing knowledge, which is of course one of the most salient aspects of Aristotelianism, is also exercised on the modes of discourse. So from this standpoint, one may wonder whether the inclusion of the Socratic dialogues in the genre of literary imitations, whether Aristotle classifies all of Plato's dialogues or only some of them as Logoi Socraticoi, uh, we may wonder if this inclusion does not subtly signal the distance that separates Plato's philosophical project intrinsically linked to a literary form, admittedly very malleable, and to a large extent linked to the old quarrel between philosophy and poetry on the one hand, and on the other hand, so it distinguishes this from Aristotle's own project where this quarrel is definitely settled. And uh, third uh, remark, uh, let us uh, note that what is true of Aristotle is certainly not true of the Aristotelian tradition. For it is likely that these analyses of Aristotle were later used by the peripatetic school to discredit Plato. Uh, this passage of the Poetics marks the initial moment of a long tradition associating Plato with Sophron, a tradition which continued in peripatetic circles and whose proponents sometimes sought to discredit Plato. And the mention of Plato's taste for Sophron is frequent in antiquity, of course. But the earliest name associated with this idea, I think, is Juris of Samos. And Juris of Samos is a pupil of Theophrastus, uh, according to whom Plato always had Sophron under his hand. Given what is known elsewhere from Proclus about Juris's criticisms of the Platonic treatment of poetry, it is not absurd to think that Juris's remark is one element among others belonging to a more general criticism of Plato in Aristotelian, Aristotelian uh, circles. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm leaving the, um, the appendix on Alexaminus of Theos because I've already been too long. Thank you. On behalf of the muted audience, um, as those of you who've been to these before know, we have a discussion period now uh, moderated by me. If you wish to make a comment or ask a question, please click the raise your hand button. If you have trouble with the raise your hand button, send a private chat to me. Um, I'll be monitoring this uh, during the session. Please keep your questions concise. Um, we welcome your comments and suggestions afterwards. Send them to Socrates Society at rice.edu. All right, uh, floor is open for discussion. Raise your hands. Nick Smith. Hi, I enjoyed that. Um, I have a, I have a, a really ignorant question, and perhaps you can help me uh, overcome my ignorance. Um, so, looking at the last the T four, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I really liked how you what you did with that. But um, I found myself uh, wondering about what this this particular genre is supposed to be by the time you were done discussing it, uh, because it looks like the same thing can be said. Uh, uh, but the, what he's saying here about Socratic dialogues mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. Socratic logoi seems like the same thing can be said of comedy, tragedy. What the speakers say in those certainly re- reveals character in, in exactly the same way. So I, I'm wondering how this ends up being a contrast yeah. to anything. I mean, it's obviously a contrast to uh, to mathematics, but it's not really a contrast to all lots and lots of other forms of literature. So I, I just wondered if you could uh, clarify mm. that. Thank you, thank you, Nick. No, it's a very good question. And, and, and to be honest, I, I, I have no convincing answer to that. You're right. I mean, it is, it works with other, other literary genres just as well, okay? As long as you can see, you know, preferential choices. The, the fact remains that he contrasts uh, mathematical uh, treatises and uh, uh, and Socratic uh, logoi. Now, I, I was I, I kept I didn't say ev- everything on that passage. Uh, your question makes me realize that I should have mentioned that there is a, a stronger interpretation than the one I've been advocating. I don't know if you know about it. And Nick, it's the, the in the interpretation given by Gigon. I think it's in, in the in the bibliography. Uh, let me check. Uh, yeah, uh, the the 1959 paper, and and Gigon gives a much heavier interpretation of the of this passage than I did, uh, arguing that Aristotle is here referring to uh, a genuinely Socratic position, and more precisely uh, to that of Aristippus, who rejected mathematics on the ground that it does not contribute to anything to ethical. Uh, education of man. You see, you see the point? So uh, uh, one way to account for this contrast, to make it specific between, on the one hand, um, uh, mathematics, and on the other hand, uh, the Socratic logos, is to understand it much more narrowly than I did, okay, and, and, and see it as a reference, a precise reference to a one Socratic, which is Aristippus. Now, I don't know if I'm entirely convinced by this first, by that, that gig on uh, interpretation. I think it's it's very hard to find compelling argument. And then, even though you're right that the the contrast, I mean the the contrast would work with other types of uh, speeches as well. Does that uh, invalidate the idea that Aristotle took understood? the Socratic logoi, at least as concerned with ethical choices. And that's an interesting thing to um, to keep in mind. I know, I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't think I have a better answer. That's <laughs> your very good question. Sorry. All right, uh, William Osman. Yeah, thank you, Dimitri. Um, Hello. Um, I, I want to ask you about the kind of preliminary slander or criticism, which is that Plato expels Homer for using mimesis, and yet he uses mimesis himself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm I'm curious if you think that that is something that Aristotle um, that Aristotle was accusing Plato of, or whether that comes to us from Athenaeus. Um, because I mean, it seems to me it's a bit of a problem of how much that uh, fragment is really uh, is really from from Aristotle. Yeah. And um, you know, the word hapax applause, clearly Aristotle didn't use that word. It's it's a pretty uh-huh. late word in terms of. Uh, but but I'm curious. Uh, uh, other than that philological point, is I'm curious what you think about that as a criticism, whether from Athenaeus. 
or from Aristotle or from William Altman. I mean, isn't it actually true that Plato is being uh, self-contradictory by expelling the poets on the grounds that he's against mimesis when he made a career out of imitating Socrates and the Socratic Logoi? Isn't that a just criticism? And what do you personally ah. make of that? Oh, thank you. So, so there are two questions in your question. One is what, what do I think about the general point? Is, is Plato being, you know, uh, is, is, is Plato contradicted in himself by criticizing poetry and being the kind of poet he is? That's one thing. And the other thing is, do I believe that uh, the text um, quoted by Athenaeus is, is, is genuine? On the first question, well, I don't think this is such a good argument, to be honest, uh, and such a good criticism to, to put forward to Plato. I mean, first, Plato wouldn't perhaps see himself as a poet, okay, even though he, you know, he can obviously write poetry. So maybe that, I don't think he would see the contradiction, although I, I don't really know if it's, but I could argue it um, um, more precisely. And on the first question, well, it's it's a complicated matter because it seems to me that if uh, Athenaeus is quoting, so let me just say one thing: Athenaeus, in all likelihood, is quoting from a source. Okay, clearly, presumably, the source of Athenaeus could have been either Savorinus of Ars, who is very interested, as I said, in Euremata, who discovered what, who was the first discoverer of X and Y, okay? Or, as During argued ages ago, um, uh, it's possible that uh, Athenaeus is copying um, a treatise by uh, Herodicus of Babylon called against the admirer of Socrates, okay, where uh, the, the treatise was um, um, criticizing Plato for just what you said, okay, for, for being condemning the poets and, and, and using poetry himself. So this seems to me to be, I mean, elements that one could put forward to say, well, uh, if um, Athenaeus is polemicizing against Plato in this whole section. And you know, and, and the, the polemic starts pages before this fragment, okay? When uh, Athenaeus criticizing Plato for uh, making uh, a nice portrait of Mino in the Mino. Uh, and, and, he, and, and he piles up arguments against Plato for you know, being so nice to Mino and so on and so forth. And then he comes to that argument saying, you know, uh, he's not the inventor of this form of poetry and so on and so forth. So it seems to me that Athenaeus was interested in that question and then he found in his source, which was also interested in that question, who was the first discoverer of what? And that could be uh, an argument in favor of saying that the text, the fragment is, is, is genuine because uh, Athenaeus was really looking for uh, the point he wanted to make. And the point he wanted to make that was that Plato was not the first inventor uh, of, of the dialogue form. I don't know if my answer is clear. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a complicated question and maybe my ideas are not clear uh, as well, but I, I, I have other arguments in favor of, of keeping the fragment as it is, even though it troubles me because we don't know anything about this and examine us. And, it, and it's very weird that we have this guy who was the first to uh, write Socratic dialogues and we never heard of him instead of this, uh, apart from this text. Okay, Thomas. Uh, so the question about Athenaeus's uh, source is actually a great lead into what I wanted to ask you about. And that's a Diogenes, Diogenes Laertius's seemingly mm -hmm. parallel uh, discussions, which I was yeah. surprised there wasn't more about that uh, in the talk as you you presented it. Um, so uh, on the presupposition that 
Diogenes and Athenaeus are probably looking at at least some of the same sources, although they, mm -hmm. although they may also have uh, other sources unique to one or the other. I'm wondering what to make of two claims in particular. So first, uh, book three, uh, section 48. So uh -huh. this is the report of Alex Semenos. And yeah. there he starts by saying that some or they, whatever, say that Zeno wrote dialogues yeah. first, and then yeah. others yeah. say Alex Semenos, and then others, yeah. well, Diogenes says, I think it should be Plato because he perfected the form, and so he should be called first. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if we should see this claim that, you know, Zeno might have been the first to write these dialogues. Would this have been something that Aristotle himself might have considered as a possibility? Do you think this is a later accretion to the tradition, mm -hmm. uh, a later addition to the question of who came first and what would have prompted that later addition? I just like mm -hmm. your thoughts on that. And then second, mm -hmm. uh, section 18. Uh, so when he says that Plato was the first uh, who brought uh, the minds of Sophron to Athens and who he was the first to athopoesi, make mm -hmm. characters like Sophron, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. should we be seeing that as well? You suggested that part of this might have been a later peripatetic thing. Should we be seeing mm -hmm. that as uh, a later peripatetic mythologizing about Plato? Should we be thinking that that's part of what's going on in the shared sources potentially of Athenaeus and Diogenes? What should we make of that vis-a-vis -vis the Sophron question? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And those, I mean, it's two great questions. I don't know if I have nice answers. To be honest, I don't know what to make. So you you rightly noted that I did that said a very little about this passage in Diogenes Laertius. Now you know why, because I don't know what to make of that reference to Zeno. I don't I don't have a clue. Uh, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what you know. Where did did, did Diogenes find this? Was it in in Favorinus, whom we know he followed quite closely in part of of the light. I, I, I don't know. To be honest, I, I'm, I, I really don't know, but you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a problem. Uh, um, uh, and yeah, um, so that's one thing. And the other, <laughs> the other passage, so 318 that you mentioned where, where he mentioned Sofran, um, that's also great. Uh, actually, I forgot to mention that passage. So thank you so much. Uh, it might, I have to think more about this. It might be, it might weaken my argument, you're right, that uh, this association between Sophron and Plato uh, has only a polemic, uh, has only a polemic intent that would be rooted in Aristotelian circles. You're right. Uh, hmm. Again, the, the thing is, it's so complicated to, to, to trace the sources of Diogenes who, you know, picks bits here and there. Uh, hmm. But you're right, and I, I, I take your point. It's, it is, I should, I should be more cautious, I think, in the end. It, it, it's, it is at least an association with, of, of Plato with Sophron that is, uh, let's say, neutral. Sorry, I've got only had the, the French here, but um, so he was Plato was uh, the first uh, to uh, make to to import into Athens the books, uh, including the works of Sophron, the, the mimographer, which were which had been uh, neglected so far. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm translating the French. <laughs> and he was the first to. Um, uh, Take an inspiration from the characters invented by this author, and these books, uh, we found them under his pillow. Well, that's what the French said. Um, I, I, you're right. It it is, um, it is neutral. I mean, there's no trace of of polemic. So that should be taken. Thank you. I mean, it's a very good point. I'm sorry that my answer is not more convincing. Just one more really quick uh, consideration that I think it uh, on the question of <laughs> Diogenes uh, um mm -hmm. Section 52 also seems relevant. So that's where uh, he suggests that 
um, Plato expounds his views to, through Socrates, Timaeus, the Athenian stranger, and the Eleatic stranger. And the reason why this might be relevant is uh, one of the later fragments of the Oxyrhynchus papyrus you're quoting, your text three, makes the yeah. exact same claim about the three, which mm. suggests that wherever the papyrus is getting its information from has to be closely connected to where Diogenes yeah. is getting his uh, information from, uh, which also okay. suggests that we've got this shared interpretive tradition that's being referred to um, by these multiple sources, which is really interesting. I don't know what to make of it, but it, it mm. seems like a, an important linking text. Oh, thank you so much. So this is Diogenes Lercia 352. Okay, all right, and, and linked to the papyrus. Thank you so much. Okay, Thornton Lockwood. Thank you, Dimitri, for your paper. Um, Hi, Thornton. So I, I appreciate that you 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 said that you're redoing uh, Demand's 1942 book, which yay, that's good. <laughs> um, and I, I think my question maybe would overlap with that, which is a little bit different than the topic of your paper. So obviously, there's these passages, and again, I'm thinking like the second book of the Politics, where where Aristotle is clearly describing. Socrates in a platonic dialogue. Mm -hmm. But there's other passages where he quotes Socrates. Um, and I'm thinking especially like in the Nicomachean and Ethics, I think there's about six or seven different references where there's no explicit reference to a, to a, a dialogue. And I, I, I'm just wondering how you deal with those passages. Is it on a case by case basis that you're yeah. saying, oh, well, this is you know an unattributed quote to the Mino or this is perhaps um, an instance in which, um, you know, Aristotle is quoting the historical Socrates. Um, like, I, I appreciate there's a lot of references and, and the best answer, maybe it, it depends, but I'm just curious, how, how do you go about those passages where we have a quote to Socrates, but we don't know exactly what Aristotle has? Mm. In mind? Well, thank you. Well, can I, can I answer in, in two different steps? The first will be, via negativa and the, and the other one will be more positive i mean negatively i think we can say that we shouldn't be convinced by you know fitzgerald's canon so as it were you know that, that famous distinction saying uh when he when aristotle uses ho oh, socrates he means like I, I can never remember which is which but he means let's say um the historical socrates and when he says socrates without the article he means uh the, plato's character i think the that other is way the, around the article I, the other way around okay yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. sorry yeah it's, it's I, more I, logical yeah <laughs> um uh, so i the first my first the first part of my answer is that i don't think we should be convinced by that i don't think it works okay i mean i have i i have checked it a long time ago on, on some passages and i did, didn't think it was really working so that's one thing the other more positive answer is that Yes, I think it's very difficult not to deal uh, case by case. And um, it's absolutely true that Aristotle uh, has learned about Socrates from Plato's dialogues, Xenophon's uh, works, any other Socratic literature that he might have read. And of course, he also heard things about uh, Socrates when he was in the academy and that there was this memory <laughs> of, of, of that guy who um, passed away a few decades before. So I think it's all, all those sources, you can always, you know, you, you always have to take all of them into account, but I don't think it's, it, it's very difficult to trace back, it's very easy on some cases. For instance, if you think about uh, 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 when he mentioned Socrates uh, in the in the politics, I think there was the passage that you mentioned. So um, um, I think this is I can't remember the the reference uh, one thirteen. I think it's politics one thirteen, something like that. Uh, uh, and it's quite clear that he has. Uh, uh, on site, but that does does not does not mean that he he only relies on Plato. I mean, was that was that what you? Well, I, I was thinking of the easier examples, which is the discussion, the explicit discussion of the Republic in, in Book Two of the Politics. But yeah, the the, the Politics One Thirteen is that's that's a good example where 
Mm. I mean, he says it's a Gorgias quote, but yeah. It, yeah. Looks, it looks like Nino. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I, I, I look forward to seeing the book. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> thank you very much, but I had to write it first. Indeed. <laughs> Peter Saint-André. Yes, thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting. Um, to William Altman's point about uh, Homer, the criticism of Homer, um, you know, I think that was a lot of, the focus was on the portraying the gods in negative light. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you plan in your work on the book to go and look at how the different points that Aristotle makes in the poetics might apply to the Socratic mm -hmm. dialogues. For mm -hmm. instance, in chapter two, he talks about tragedy portraying the characters as better than they are. And we yeah. can look at the all of Plato's dialogues as a kind of extended apologia for the character of Socrates. Um, mm -hmm. Chapter four, mm -hmm. I think he talks mm -hmm. about the imitation of nobler actions and the actions of good men. So I think there's some very interesting things that one could do looking at the points that Aristotle makes about tragedy and epic and applying some of those to the Socratic dialogue. So it'd be very interesting if you might look at that when you're working on the book. Thank you so much. It's a very nice idea, actually. You're right. I mean, I have, as I said in the introduction, I think it's it's... There's a lot more in the poetics, uh, you know, but you can only you, you can't just decide it's anti platonic or, or platonic or whatever that means. Instead of, I mean, the only, you know, compelling method, I think, is just to look at case by case. And, and this is very interesting. Thank you so much for the suggestions. I hadn't really thought about really, you know, diving into uh, the poetics to try to see if more could be said on the Socratic form of the dialogue and the platonic dialogues but i think it's a very good idea and you're right and i think those two in in the apology is or somewhere you know is there is the reversal in recognition in those kinds of things it would be very interesting to kind of look at that at the dramatic elements of the dialogues and see how they mm. perhaps line up with some of the points that aristotle makes so i i look forward to your work further thank okay, you thank, well thank you so much but thank you for the uh, for the ideas William Altman has another question. William? Yes, Dimitri, it's a little bit like Thornton in the sense that I wanted to, I was intrigued by the two book projects that you mentioned mm -hmm. about the dialogue after Plato and also about the Dema uh, replacement. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to uh, ask, uh, to cluster around a question about Xenophon. Um, first of all, Thomas mentioned the texts um, in the life of Plato, um, but there's also a text in, in Diogenes Laertius' life of, of Xenophon, where uh, at, where at, at, uh, at 248, uh, mm -hmm. where Diogenes Laertius makes the amazing claim that Xenophon was the first one to write dialogues that had the dialogue uh. Socrates, uh, which of course has been completely rejected by many people, uh, mm. not the greatest of reasons, it seems to me, since clearly Sophron, whatever his priority was, had nothing to do with Socrates. I was mm. very delighted when you, that, so this is about your demand book. Uh, you, mm. you, you actually mentioned Xenophon in that context, uh, because you said that was one of his sources. And I noticed that you put Meyer's book on your bibliography. And Meyer makes a pretty interesting argument about uh, Aristotle's mm -hmm. dependence on Xenophon uh, memorabilia 4.6. Yeah. So I, yeah. And demand gives that short shrift. So I was wondering if you were going to find more of Xenophon's influence on, uh, on uh, Aristotle, Socrates than, than your predecessor does. And finally, about your book about the dial, are you counting uh, Aristotle's Gryllus as a dialogue after Plato, um, mm. because because it seems to me that I I'm I'm very curious what you, if you're going to write about the dialogue after Plato or at least non-Platonic dialogues, it seems to me that Gryllus is something that would be very interesting to deal with, and since Gryllus is pretty obviously I take it the son of Xenophon killed at the Battle of Mantinea in 362. Um, and since it clearly related to Isocrates, well, I mean, I don't mean to go and go off on that. Are you planning to 
deal with the Grillis in your projected book on the dialogue? And if so, are you going to deal with Xenophon in that context, as well as in the post demain uh, kind of Meyer influenced uh, uh, Xenophon, it's Aristotle's dependence on Xenophon for certain things? Uh, thank you. Thank you, William. Um, so just one one slight correction. I'm, I'm not writing a book on the on the dialogue form uh, after play. I'm just trying to write a paper that I need to write for a volume on the on the academy. And I just had I had this sort of view that I wanted to. But maybe it's, you know, I haven't written the paper. and I've done some research, but not enough. And, and I had this sort of view that I wanted to reflect on what became you know what became of the, of the dialogue form after Plato in the academy and what traces do we have of dialogue forms and I had two main targets so not Aristotle's grillus but thank you for the suggestion I will think about it one was uh, Heraclitus Ponticus and the other one was Aristotle so I was really planning on writing a paper only on that and not at all writing a book on the dialogue form uh, on this so on, on the first topic uh, yes, I'm planning to write this book uh, because I think, I mean, I was very impressed with reading Demont, but so much has been going on on Aristotle, Socrates, and Aristotle, Socrates, uh, since 1942, that I think it would be a good idea to, uh, 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 to you know, try to have a, a closer look at, at the fragments and also quote them differently um, and also quote the, the, the commentators. Uh, to Aristotle with the fragments, so it would be a, 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 it would be a sort of a translation edition translation of the fragments, extended one with commentary. So it's a very simple format, uh, you know. But really trying to to uh, to take one step further than than demanded. And and there's also a lot of of course books on and and papers on on Aristotle, Socrates in in English that will be taken into account. That's one thing. Um, uh, yes, and I think I would. I think I think I would I would I will uh, take more into account Xenophon than Demont did, Good. and I think that Demont did so because he was very much influenced by Taylor, that you know, nineteen eleven paper by Taylor, uh, uh, which was which made this very very strong point that you know Socrates, the true historical Socrates, is in Plato, and we don't really need to look at anything else okay and I think Demont was quite impressed although he's more balanced than Taylor and so I think he really didn't did not really care about Xenophon so I I, tr I will try to to make more uh, to take into account more Xenophon yes and thank you for the grillers Sandra Peterson I'm just wondering if Aristophanes clouds would count as a Socratic dialogue if it didn't scan ah. <laughs> Um, that's a very good question. Well, clearly, it's just, it's it's a testimony, and 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 that we can't, you know, avoid, as it were. But would it count as? Do you mean? I mean, is your question? Would it count as a dialogue given uh, what I said about? Um, Aristotle's view in T four about ethical choices and the like was that your, was that your question or was it a more general point? I don't really know what I was asking, but I, I I'm just wondering whether Aristotle would have counted it or ah. it would be very ah. early. I mean, it would be earlier than Alexaminus, whoever he was. Sure. I mean, so. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. I don't think he would actually. Uh, and, and of course, it would be a bit weird, wouldn't it, in the in the poetics, if he had he had written the, the second book on comedy. Yeah, so no. of course, we don't we don't know. Maybe he talked about. Yeah, I wonder if it inspired Plato to write his. I mean, well, I just you know, your paper was very stimulating, so thank you. And I wish you had time to say what's in your appendix. Ah, <laughs> well, in the, in the appendix, I'm just making the simple claim. I, I can I can tell you, it's very easy. I'm trying to. Uh, give arguments to defend the view that the correction of uh, the correcting protus into proteron or proterus, you know, to have, to get a, a less extravagant uh, 
message is 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 not necessary and that there are arguments even though it is it's a very surprising passage that there are arguments that one can uh, put forward to say that Anax um, Athenaeus was quoting precisely Aristotle. And I'm, so I'm trying, and one argument that I have, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to um, um, say clearly, is I don't know if you notice in T1, he says, uh, so he quotes Aristotle and he says, uh, so I'm reading in Greek, Antichrus Tascon or Polymatestatos Aristotle, uh, which I translated, uh, the very learned Aristotle thus openly saying that Anaximenus wrote dialogues before Plato. And I was wondering what this means, openly saying. And I was trying to argue in, in the appendix that maybe it's the, the, um, the sign that Athenaeus uh, knows that he's using a fragment of Aristotle, which is not exactly on the same topic that he's um, addressing in the context, but then that he says that ex you can explicit what Aristotle says, openly saying, to, to use it in his own way. It's a very convoluted argument. I mean, maybe it's a desperate argument. I don't know. Ed Halper. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dimitri. Um, Hello. Was very, hi, very interesting. Um, this actually follows uh, Sandra's uh, question. Um, I, I'm wondering whether there, 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 there are two senses of dialogue, and one of them is just a conversation, mm -hmm. and the other one is the, this philosophically charged uh, work. And uh, I'm wondering whether a Alex uh, Aminus maybe wrote a dialogue ah. in that former sense, which just wasn't philosophical. And and whether mm. whether when Aristotle is talking about uh, dialogue in the Poetics, he means the philosophical sense. Is it, is it mm. a, does it have to have a philosophical sense or um, you know, mimes? Mm. Um, it, mimes don't obviously, and yeah. and. Uh, um, Oh. oh, thank you. No, it's a very nice point. Actually, it would be. I mean, it's 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 a it's a it, actually it's a crucial point. I mean, if you're right, uh, it really really weakens my my whole point because then Aristotle would be just you know um, um, alluding to a sort of you know genre you know as you say non-philosophical then it would be pointless to ask about uh, maybe a polemical intent it would be pointless to uh, ask whether uh, he um uh, understands uh dialogues as expressing uh, moral choices and so on and so forth what troubles me a bit uh with this um view is that I don't think it works so well with T4. Do you see, do you see the point? It seems to me that- um, right, right. In, the rhetor in the rhetoric, it's definitely- In the fair. rhetoric, yes, yeah. 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 Um, but you're right, it, it's, you, you're perfectly right to say that I assume in this paper and in my reading that when Aristotle says Socratic koi logoi, he always means the same thing, you're right. And if that is not correct, well, well, I have problems. <laughs> That's true. I don't know if I have an arg a powerful argument to demonstrate that he may that he's always using th th those words to refer to the same thing, namely to Socratic philosophical literature. Uh, but of course, you would solve. I, I see where I see where you're going because you would solve the problem. Alexamenus would then be uh, totally in insignificant. Can you say that insignificant yeah. character? So Actually, yeah. his not his not mentioning Alexamenus in in the Poetics actually sure. strengthens strengthens your view that it's that's what he's talking about here, hmm. the philosophically charged dialectic. Yeah. Still, in in the fragment of the Poets in T one, he says that Alexamenus 
wrote Socratic dialogues, and that cannot be something unphilosophical, right? Don't you think? I don't know. I don't know. Mm. You, yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, it would surprise me if, if, if some something um, um, labeled Socratic could be understood as you know simple everyday conversation. That's why that's why the comparison with the minds is so interesting. Well, I, I thought, obviously minds. Are, I thought sorry. your point. I, I may have misunderstood you. I thought your point was that Sofron was was running the minds with the action. And that mm -hmm. uh, an examinist was was doing the logi with the words, so he he might have even in, in the dialogue he might have had a, a motivation to just mention an ex, uh, uh, examinist uh, as just just for systematic purposes, so he could get both of them in, mm. and and that would again strengthen your point that in, in the poetics he's really talking about a philosophically charged dialectic. Ah, okay. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. anyway. Okay. Mm. No, thank you. Thank you. Now I need to think more about that. Yeah. Thanks for the paper. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, let's thank our speaker for a rich and fascinating talk. And um, well, thank you so much. Well, um, next February um, under a new regime. Thank you so much for the discussion. I really learned a lot from it. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>